So this is revision of the AQA space physics topic. Now in the universe there are hundreds of millions of galaxies and the Milky Way is the one that we're in and in each of these galaxies there are different stars and what I like to think about is our own solar system which is surrounding our Sun. So you have the Sun over here then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. These are the small smaller kind of rocky planets and then further away from the Sun you have the gas giants. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And to remember the order, if you need to, you've got S-U-N, so you start with the Sun and you end with the Sun. Now, in addition to these eight planets, what we have are a number of moons. So going around the Earth, we have our natural satellite, our moon. But don't forget that uh, these other planets as well, they have their own moons as well. So these moons are orbiting their planet, and we do have some other things which are orbiting the Sun. Uh, for example, you've got comets, which you know maybe aren't round, but we have these kind of comets and asteroids, and maybe these have a more elliptical orbit around the Sun. But where did our Sun come from? Well, it started out in a nebula. Now, a nebula is just a massive cloud of dust and gas, and all of these particles, they're all attracted to one another due to the force of gravity. And what they do is when they come together, they basically they lose some of their potential energy, and that's transferred to their kinetic energy store. And this then forms what we call a protostar. And eventually this protostar turns into what we call a main sequence star. And this is basically where the star is in its stable phase. It's gonna spend about 95% of its life there. And basically what you have is there's an equilibrium between the fact that gravity is pulling everything in and there's nuclear fusion happening, which is kind of pushing everything apart. And this is where the star's in equilibrium. It's not getting bigger or smaller. So that's the main sequence. And if we have a star a bit like our sun, so a sort of low to medium mass star, that's where it's gonna spend most of its life. But at the end of its life, it starts to run out of fuel, the hydrogen that it's fusing into helium. And what happens then is it actually expands. It gets cooler, but it gets bigger. And then it becomes a red giant. Now, when it's a red giant, we're having fusion of heavier elements, but it gets to a point where it just runs out of fuel. And at that point, it then gets smaller and smaller and shrinks. Now, as it shrinks, uh, the surface does get hotter. And this is basically where it kind of dies, effectively. And it's a very, it's very, very small, so it's called a dwarf. And because it's um, got the actual surface has got hotter, even though it's giving out less energy, this is what we call a white dwarf. And eventually, after billions and billions of years, this white dwarf is going to cool down to make a black dwarf. So this is the stellar evolution. What happens to a star like it, our sun through its lifetime? But we also have bigger stars as well. So again, if you have a bigger star, it's going to start in a dust cloud called a nebula. But this time, um, because there's more stuff that comes together, what we get is a bigger protostar. And a bigger protostar is going to make an even bigger main sequence star. Now this main sequence star, because it's bigger, there's more stuff. So there's a bigger force due to gravity pulling everything in. And that means that actually bigger stars burn through their fuel a lot quicker. They often burn brighter. So this is more of a whitey to even blue color compared to the yellowy orangey color of stars like our sun. So this main sequence star, it burns through its fuel really quickly. So it gets to the red giant stage uh, really, really quickly as well. And then it becomes a red supergiant. And again, this is furiously burning fuel. And at the end of it, what happens is there's no more fuel. The force of gravity pulls everything in and the outer parts of that star bounce off the very dense core that's remaining. And then there's this massive explosion, which, you know, basically lights up a whole galaxy. This is called a supernova. And then one of two things can occur. Basically, whatever's left over, um, the kind of the, the core that's left, it's basically giving out a huge amount of energy and it's spinning really, really quickly. And effectively, all of the particles inside, because there's no fusion taking place, all of the electrons and protons have been pushed into each other to make neutrons. And it's a bit like a massive nucleus for an atom. So this one here is what we call a neutron star. But if the star is super big, then actually everything would just keep collapsing under gravity. There's no force that can actually uh, cause this to not get any smaller. And what happens then is that all of this mass ends up shrinking into effectively no volume. Pretty weird stuff, but this is called a black hole. And these are absolutely fascinating. The strength of gravity is so much that not even light can escape. Now we can't really actually directly see a black hole necessarily. We can maybe only see the effects that it has on things nearby, but you can't, there's no light being emitted, so we can't actually see light shining out of a black hole. Now gravity 
is super important. Gravity is what's pulling everything together, so things heat up, and that allows fusion to take place. So fusion is a joining together of light nuclei, and this means that uh, we start to create new elements. Although anything that's bigger than iron, because iron is the most stable element, anything which is bigger than iron, maybe the iron in your body at the moment, maybe any gold you have in your jewellery, that must have been created in a supernova. Now when the supernova happens, it kind of distributes these elements throughout the universe, which then might end up making another nebula, and then that then forms maybe the star in the centre of a solar system, as well as the material for the planets. So you've been formed in one of these supernovas. Now the other thing that gravity does is it allows all of these planets and all of the satellites to remain in orbit. Because if you have maybe um, a sun here in the middle and you've got the Earth which is orbiting around it at a certain speed, there's a force of gravity that's pulling this in. And what this gravity is doing, it's a force that isn't changing the speed but it's changing the direction. And this then means that things follow a circular path. That's supposed to be a circle there. But you can have things like this comet over here. Now this can still have a stable kind of elliptical orbit around maybe a sun over here. But what happens here is that as it gets closer, because it's losing some of its potential energy that's been converted to the kinetic store, it moves slowly a long way away, then it travels really quickly as it goes near the sun, sort of slingshotted round, and then its velocity uh, decreases again. So we can still have a stable elliptical orbit for objects like comets, but this is where they're travelling slowly a long way away from the star, and they travel a lot quicker when they get closer to it. Now we've seen that stars have a lifetime, and actually what we find is that when we look at stars which are a long, long way away, um, we seem to see that actually some of the light that they emit seems to be stretched, and actually the universe is expanding. Now if it's expanding now, that meant yesterday it was a little bit smaller and the day before it was a bit smaller. And if we go far back enough in time, we find that actually there was a point when the whole universe had no dimensions. And this is the point that we call the Big Bang. Now the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago. And at that point, all of space and all of time was created. It's very strange to think, but before the Big Bang, time didn't exist. So this started everything. So the evidence for the Big Bang is that um, when we look at light from stars, uh, maybe this is what the light should be. When we look at light from distant stars, that light all appears to be stretched. Now the wavelength has increased, and if you remember from your work on the electromagnetic spectrum, when you have a longer wavelength, we then have red light. So what we see is that things which are further away, there's something that we call redshift. And actually, when we, do, uh, when we look at different galaxies which are even further away, the further away the galaxy is, the bigger the redshift of that light. And that means that everything is expanding away from everything else in the universe, which meant at some point it must have all been uh, in the same place. And there's some kind of clever physics we can do to actually work out that this is 13.8 billion years old. Now, in the last 20 years or so, we found that not only is the universe expanding, but the rate of expansion is getting faster and faster and faster. So we don't quite know exactly why that is. And that's the really interesting thing about science. You know, we don't know all of the answers. Obviously, telescopes are getting better. We've got more people working on it. We've got things like LIGO looking at gravitational waves. Super, super exciting bits of physics. And it might be that there's dark matter or there's dark energy, which is driving this rapid inflation of the universe. But basically, um, this is just a quick bit of revision of a small amount of space physics, a super fascinating topic. So we've got the parts of the solar system, we've got evolution of low mass and high mass stars, as well as evidence for things like the Big Bang.